pay them the full 200. So there is, there is certainly a financial incentive for doctors to do clinical trials, but they're not getting paid more than their regular fees. Most doctors are not independent standalone doctors. They are parts of practices. They are parts of the hospital. They work as a group. So they get paid only a fraction. But some estimate a doctor may get less than 5% of the payment that's given to a son for a trial. So they get, there's a lot of overhead, there are nurses, there are so many people who work at a trial. All of them have to be, have to be paid. So doctors many a time get paid a small fraction of it. Now, I'm not saying they don't get paid now, but they do get, they don't get all the money that goes to us right now. Most doctors are not allowed to have commercial interest in the product they are testing. If a doctor invents a drug, they have to go find other doctors to do the trial and pay them for it. Most doctors are restricted by law to not be the testers of the drugs that they develop or they own, if they own a company, if they have commercial interest in a product, they are restricted by law to, uh, to participate in the trial as an investigator. And not only that, this year, there's a new act that got passed under Obamacare called the Sunshine Act. Now, Sunshine Act requires the doctors disclose all the payments made to them by pharmaceutical companies irrespective of what it was for, for a clinical trial or for giving a talk or anything else, they have to report it to the government. And the government will put it on a website that patients can go and Google them. It's going to be a searchable website that you can go and find out how much money did my doctor make last year from drug companies and which drug company. So there are going to be even more transparency as to what doctors have paid. Um, so, coming back to the original questions, doctors get paid too much to participate in clinical trials. How many still think it's true? <laughs> well, it's true. You are really determined. <laughs> Just going around, <laughs> making both loads of money, you know, how to make money, you know, one way to, one way to just be a professional trial participant. How many think that's realistic? <laughs> <laughs> How many think there are people like that? Does anybody know that people like that? A few of you. Well, 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 well. Let's try to find out the facts. There are very strict rules about what you can get paid to participate in a trial. It is directly proportional to how much time you will need to spend at the site. And it has to be what would be reasonable to compensate you for your time and effort. Usually, it means it's time for, it's probably your fare, to and fro fare from your home, and maybe a little like, you know, money for lunch, a little bit extra, but it's, it's strictly regulated as to how much sponsors can pay. So sponsors cannot, even if we want to, we cannot go out and pay people enormous amounts of money to participate in our trials. Any payment we make, to a patient has to be approved by an independent review board. And they are liable. Independent review boards, when they approve clinical trials without proper oversight, do get sanctioned. They do sometimes get fined. Sometimes people have even gone to jail for that. So it is a very responsible position that the IRBs have. They cannot be high enough to induce participation. Giving somebody too much money is considered coercion. It's considered financial coercion, it's unethical, it's illegal, and it's a punishable offense. If you try to do something under the table, you know, take a few hundred bucks, you can't do that. You can't do that in most countries in the world. There was a movie some years back, The Constant Gardener. Anybody heard of that movie? That movie was about a trial done in Africa by a big pharmaceutical company where they were paying a lot of money to participate in very risky clinical trial, a trial that people were getting killed on. Those practices used to exist, and that's why we have rules. Guys, all these all this rules that we have today did not just come out of somebody's dream. They were based on accidents. All the rules, unfortunately, are knee-jerk reactions. Knee-jerk reactions to an accident. Somebody was doing something bad, 
the regulators found out about it and they started making rules about it. Anybody knows about the new thing that is happening about pharmacies? There's a rule being made these days? Anybody heard of compounding pharmacies? We had no rules for compounding pharmacies for all these years. And some people died and suddenly there's a rule in process. It's going to get passed hopefully by this year. FDA audited 39 pharmacies that compound drugs. They found 38 of them to be non-compliant. <laughs> that tells you a lot about regulations. If you don't have them, that happens. And that's today. That's just two weeks back. It's not, it's not 10 years old information. It's new information. So there are rules for, for many things we do. But we cannot pay people too much money. It's called financial coercion. And most of our trials would restrict people from participating in more than one trial. So when you participate in a trial, the participant has to sign on a piece of paper saying that I am not taking any other investigational drug. Now, does it mean people don't lie? <laughs> How many of you think everybody is truthful in the clinical trial statement? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, it does happen. There have, been, there have been incidences. But if a sponsor find out, if I find out when I'm doing the audit, that a participant, I see the same names and looks like fishy, that is possible. We have to reject the trial. That is unethical. Because drugs could have side effects that we don't know of. And if they're taking more than one investigational drug, there is no way to know if they are cross-reacting. So if there are, if there are participants, actually that's a disqualification, reason for disqualification. We do blood tests, we test the blood for different kinds of things. If we find out that a participant is participating in more than one trial, we usually take them off the trial. We reject the patient. So let's go to the next one. This is something you hear all the time also. Participants are not told of risks. If you watch any humorous, so-called humorous movie that makes fun of clinical trials, this is the most common thing they use. The people participating in trial, watching an episode of Two and a Half Men, where <laughs> the younger brother participates in the trial and loses his hair and all things that could go wrong, go wrong. If that happens in a clinical trial, and I was a sponsor, I would be talking to you from behind the bars. <laughs> That's how it is. So risk information is a requirement. It's not, it's not a good practice. It's not recommended. It's not suggested. It's a requirement. It's a requirement to provide detailed information about all aspects of a given clinical trial all its known and potential risks. When we do develop a new drug or a new vaccine, we know the science, we are smart people, we can extrapolate what things can happen, even the things that were not seen in our animal studies, we can predict. So we are supposed to tell the patient about not only the risks that we know about, but also the potential risks. What are the potential risks? And actually that's a very, very important part of the informed consent. Not only that, it has to be explained in a simple language. The rules are, the language of an informed consent should be of, an, of a grade eight level. Somebody who has eighth grade education should be able to read it and understand it. They could be long documents, but they're supposed to be simplified. That doesn't mean that sometimes informed consents are too complex. Sometimes, even though they try, they try to simplify, they try to tell too many things, and it gets beyond an 8th grader, it becomes ninth grader or 10th grader. What happens then? It has to be done in a language that the participant can understand. So if you do a language in, in, a, in, a, in a location where people are Spanish speaking, you're supposed to provide a Spanish translation. You're supposed to provide a Spanish interpreter. If you are doing it in China, you have to do translations in Chinese. And you have to provide interpreters. And you have to give the participants as much time as they need. When I audit, the one thing I look for is, how long did the patient take before they decided to enroll? If they say, well, he showed up and we showed him this form and he signed on, like he showed up at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock he signed off, and it's a 10-page document that I need, that I know needs 
a day, even for me, to understand, I'm going to disqualify them. I'm going to say, your informed consent is not right. I need to see, I need to witness it. That's what you do, that's what we call as witness informed consent. We have to go and see them, how they give the informed consent. But usually, as a general practice, because there have been many, many, many cases of patients accusing doctors of not uh, letting them read the informed consent long enough, not go and talk to their friends, their family, their doctors, their relatives. Uh, we have now kind of made a rule in the industry, an unwritten rule, that you usually give people at least one day. You give them the day before they show up. So they get to read it, they get to talk to their, their brothers, their sisters, their friends, whosoever they need to. So, the statement, people are not told about risk, is a myth. Mostly. I would say mostly because I don't speak for the entire industry. This one is related to the informed consent. They are too long, they are fine print, they look like the bank, bank statement. I don't want to read it. Nobody can read it. Nobody can understand it. Now, what I told you in the last slide should probably help with some of that. As I said, it has to have all information about the given trial. It has to be simple. Um, it has to be simplified. I think the big word over here is simplified. What we expect from all clinical trials is that they will be simplified. They will be extremely simplified for everybody to be able to understand what they are signing off on. Another one, we hear a lot. Once you sign on a piece of paper, it's a legal piece of paper. You cannot get out of it. You signed your name on this informed consent. If you leave, they're going to do something bad to you. Is that true? Well, glad to hear that. You cannot coerce people into participating. There are very clear rules about not doing clinical trials in prisoners, for example. You cannot do a trial in, on prisoners. Most of the trials, even when you do trials in the military, you're supposed to run trials by independent body. Because if the general tells the soldier, hey, take this drug, what's he going to say? No, sir. <laughs> He'll take it. He'll take the bullet for you. What's the drug? So, no, you cannot do trials in, 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 in environments where people can be coerced. So, that's one of the rules. Participation has to be unconditional. When we look at informed consent, one of the things we look for is, are you giving them certain incentives? Are you, I'll give you this extra piece of advice if you, or extra piece of, uh, you know, some equipment if you participate in my trial. Uh, we were doing a trial on diabetes where we wanted to give out uh, blood sugar monitors. We wanted to give out this little thing that you prick your finger and know how much sugar you have. And we had to get approved by, by the IRB for it because it was considered as payment to the patient. You're giving them something that they would have to buy. So that's considered a payment. So you cannot give them, you cannot put any conditions. I'll do this MRI on you if you participate in my trial. No. You can withdraw at any time without giving any reason. Any trial participant can withdraw at any time without giving you any reason. Any trial participant can stop participating, can stop coming to your clinic, can stop showing up, can stop picking up his phone without giving you any reason. And if they do that, a doctor cannot deny services. If the patient, if it was your patient and the patient suddenly decides that he doesn't want to do your trial, you cannot tell the patient, okay, I can't treat you anymore. If you do that, that's again an illegal and punishable offense. Because it's unethical to force people to participate in clinical trials. So you can't, you can't always leave a clinical trial. You can always leave for whatever reasons you like. Blinded trials. Blinded trials are bad for you. What's a blinded trial? Anybody knows what the blinded trial is? There are two kinds of blinded studies, single blind and double blind. Single blind is where the doctor knows what you're getting but not you. 
And double blind is when both of you don't know what you're getting. And the reason we do that is very simple. We need these studies to remove any bias. We want to make sure that people can tell us the results without being influenced by what they were getting, without knowing if they were getting the active drug or the placebo. So as you all may have heard about the placebo effect, many times patients suddenly feel good just because they're getting a sugar pill. They may not be getting a real drug, they're getting a placebo, but they feel good about it. It's a very well-known psychological phenomena. Actually, some people have even talked about it as a biological phenomenon. Sometimes your body just makes you feel better just because you're taking a drug. You think you're taking a drug. So there is a strong placebo effect. There are some diseases where the placebo effect is very, very strong. Pain drugs. You feel better with pain. Just because somebody, tells, somebody talks nicely to you, you feel good. You don't feel the pain. Depression. Huge placebo effect in depression. So there are many drugs, many diseases where we know placebo effect is very strong. But it's true for most diseases. Many diseases have a basic placebo effect. Because when you go on a clinical trial, you are you're getting tested, you're getting all kinds of treatments, you're getting all kinds of, you know about it. You become more careful about your diet, you become more careful about, you know, how you're going to live your life, you start exercising. So you, you, you do have an effect. In type 2 diabetes, the, the diabetes that is linked to obesity, we see this all the time. When people are told you have type 2 diabetes because of, because of your obesity, people start being more careful about their diet. They're, not, they're on placebo, but they start, you start seeing benefits. So those things do happen. So you have to address placebo effect. You need to do blinded studies. Also, it increases compliance of a participant. Imagine if you knew you were getting a placebo. How likely are you to not eat that drug? <laughs> Almost always. You would just not eat the drug. You know it's placebo. Now what's going to happen? Why should I eat it? So what happens? The trial basically becomes defunct, becomes useless. So it increases compliance. And it is required by law to do a blinded study to get marketing approval. Almost no drug gets approved without showing a clear distinction between people who did not get the drug and people who got the drug. Without it, you cannot compare. Without it, you can't compare the two. It's like, what are you comparing to? Comparing, comparing it to. So you cannot get marketing approval. Yes, sir. It, it depends on what your endpoints are. What are you trying to find out? If you're trying to find out 5% improvement in blood sugar level, then that, is, that would count as improvement. Improvement is defined by your trial. Not every drug would have same level of improvement. There is no wonder drugs, guys. There is no one pill that you take and makes you nice, slime, looking slim and nice, healthy, and you can have like big biceps and six packs. There is no drug like that out there. All drugs have partial, sometimes, sometimes good partial, sometimes less partial effects. There are no wonder drugs, but drug, drug effects, uh, you do see a difference from the, if you are trying to, let's say if you're developing a drug for hypertension, you're trying to lower the blood pressure, then the, your, your drug should definitely give you better blood pressure with the drug versus placebo. And better could be five points decrease, Better could be 20 points decrease, depending on what, what the endpoints are, what your drug is. There are many drugs out there that do have very small effect. Anybody heard of this anti-cancer drug called Avastin? Do you know how much, how much benefit it gives to breast cancer patients? Anybody knows? It gives you 14 days extra life. 14 days. And do you know how much it costs? Anybody? Any estimates? $160,000. It's a very expensive drug. It gives you, actually it was withdrawn from market for that reason. Because the effect is 14 days. Statistically relevant. 14 days of life. If you were given 14 extra days to live, how would you react to that? A patient wants to live every single day. 
Ishwas is going to pay for it. So <laughs> the point is. Well then. <coughs> yes. Exactly. Exactly. That is true. That is true. But when you approve a drug based on a principle, which is an average, then you have to consider the average. Some patients actually did not benefit at all. So some patients, if you do, if 14 days is the average, trust me, nobody lived two years extra. <laughs> because if they did, the average will go through the roof. So my point is, it's very, it's very subjective. It's very subjective. And again, with all due respect, it depends on the patient. Anybody who is on the deathbed, you give them one extra day, they'll do anything. So there are ethical aspects to deny people an extra day of life. From an ethics point of view, it would be unethical to tell people you need to die today because I can't afford your drug. <laughs> and actually, you know, there was, this, there was this whole thing politically a couple of years back. There was this whole talk of death panels and things like yeah. that. Anybody remember that? That's what it was, that's what it was. Like, when you have certain times when somebody else is paying for your drug, yeah. they may want to say, you know, 14 days is not long enough for us to give you $160,000. So, what's that? Well, not under the new law. <laughs> under the new law, they cannot say that. Under the new law, which is going to be from 1st of January 2014, an insurance company cannot deny you benefits cannot deny you benefits for any reason. Because you've reached the upper limit, because it's not going to be enough benefit or whatever, they cannot say no to you. So you do need that. Clinical trials are very expensive. All agree? Don't agree? Don't agree? <laughs> well, they do cost a lot of money. I mean, this is the cost per patient. If you look at for a phase one, phase one is the early stage study. The very first study you do mostly in healthy patients, those things usually cost about $20,000 on an average per patient. So now, because phase one, there are very few patients, the total cost of the trial may be less. This red arrow indicates the total cost of the trial. So when you go to larger trials, the per patient cost is lower, but because you're doing the trials in many more people, your total cost of the trial goes up. So trials, sometimes trials could be as much as 40, 50, 60 million dollars if they're large. There was a trial done, the type 2 diabetes trial I was talking to earlier, that trial had 12,000 patients in about 70 countries. The cost of that trial was around 114 million dollars. But that said, the drug is a blockbuster drug, it will make that much money in one year. But the point is, they are very expensive. These trials are very, very, very expensive. This you may have heard. Trials are done in, in underdeveloped countries. They go to India to do trials, or China to do trials, on people who don't know better. Go to poorer neighborhoods in cities, go to inner city neighborhoods to do trials. Uh, go to undereducated people. I've heard this many times from ethicists, people who actually do this that, oh, they go to, drug companies like to go to poorer people, they like to go to people who are not as educated, they go to people who are incarcerated, either because of health or mental conditions, or people who are unable to understand. How many of you think it is true? It has to be true, wow. It has been, it has been. Well, we are talking today. <laughs> well. Well, well, let me give you the facts. Uh, about 70% of the trials in the world are done in US and Western Europe. So so-called rich countries. 70% of all clinical trials are done in US and Europe. And most of those are done in big cities, uh, big health centers, every, anywhere from the top medical institutes to smaller clinics. They're spread out. If you look at the trials, they're pretty spread out. In, in how many people participate in it. Economic realities do play a role. So if you go to Poland, if you go to Eastern Europe countries, if you go to China or India, there is still a big reason. As I said, you get free health checkup, you get, you get new drugs, you get treatments, you get to see your doctor more often. Uh, it does induce people, it, it, it plays a reason. I mean, if you go to China and do a trial, most people can't afford basic health care. 
So participating in a clinical trial gives them an opportunity to get that basic health care. In India, most cancer patients, many cancer patients can't afford a drug that would cost $6,000, $7,000 per cycle. Daxotere, the cancer drug, costs around $6,000 per cycle. That's a lot of money for many people in India. So when they participate in a trial, they get that drug. So it does play a role. So it is, it is true to some extent, but most people who participate in phase two and above clinical trials, patients who, actually patients when they participate in trials, most of them participate for non-financial reasons. As I said earlier, for cancer studies, these patients already got treatment once. They did not benefit. And most of the treatments available will most likely not work on them. So they do participate for non-financial reasons. They do participate. So there is a significant number of people who do participate in, uh, for non-financial reasons. Most of the people who participate in early stage study, healthy volunteers, phase one studies, they do for financial reasons. So this is a, this is a partial truth. This is, there is some truth to that. That, you know, clinical trials, many of them are done in people who are participating for financial reasons. So there, it is still true. For phase one studies, for most of the early studies that you do in healthy volunteers, most of those people are what we call as professional clinical trial participants. We, if you go to, there are centers across the globe, there are many centers in the US, where the clinical center, they are called phase one units, and these centers have databases of people that they call upon when they have a trial. And they come back again and again and take new drugs. Um, so, of course, we do still do all the approvals, all the reviews. We make sure that they are safe. But they do participate for financial reason alone. They are not doing it for any other reason. So there is, there is some truth to the fact that most trials are done. Some trials are done for financial reasons. Do we need more trials? Do we have enough? Is it enough, the trials we have, or should we do more trials? Anybody says yes? OK. That's right. There are about 6,000 to 8,000 diseases that have no cure. So we do want to have cure for most of those diseases. We want to treat. And there are new diseases that keep coming up. So we need to have new treatments. We need to have better treatment options for treatments that exist. Many drugs have side effects. Many drugs, we talked about side effects. Many drugs not working. Cancer patients failing one cycle, two cycles, three cycles of treatment. It, it happens fairly often. Diabetes, people not getting treated of diabetes or hypertension. Uh, we need better treatment options. And we can't have them unless we do more testing, unless we find more trials. We need multiple treatment options. Not every drug works on every person. Some people benefit from aspirin when they have headache. Some others need to, need, need to take Exedrin, and some other may need to take Tylenol. We have many options. We need more and more options. We need many treatment options. And one very important benefit of more drugs is lower cost. More treatment options, lower cost. More options increases competition. A drug that costs $160,000 will not cost that much if there were five other drugs which did the same thing. So more treatments are very, very important. So it's all in the perspective. It's all in the perspective. I mean, this is, I think, this talks about that we live at the bottom of a gravity well on the surface of a gas-covered planet going around a nuclear firewall, and we think it's normal. <laughs> it's all in the, what we look at. It's all in the perception. It's all in what we know and now don't know about it. So that's my story. It's probably a little different from yours, but the truth is somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Thank you so much. Some new treatments are factoring in the genetic markers. We call the genetic markers, 
and they are called personalized medicine. So there is a school of thought which actually uh, has been there for more than 15 years now. Uh, the human genome was mapped in the year 2000, so it was 13 years ago. And the one big reason it was done was to find out the genetic markers of diseases. We do know people differ uh, in how they react to drugs. And for some diseases, we do know. Like, for example, for breast cancer, there's a drug, there's a genetic marker called BRAC, BRAC. And if you have that disease, uh, that genetic marker, some drugs be work better on you than others. So there are some, but there are very few of that. I mean, we don't have enough. I mean, we used to think in 2000, there was, uh, when the human genome was announced and President Clinton was on the front cover of many newspapers with Francis Collin on one side and Craig Venter on the other, they said, oh, you know, 10 years from now, you'll go to a doctor's office, give a drop of blood, and they'll tell you everything about you. We are nowhere close to that. We, are, we have come a long way from a $50,000 for a genome map, we are closer to around twenty thousand dollars now, and the goal is to get to one thousand dollars for the whole gene map of an individual, which is expected to be expected to get there in about another ten years. But from there to actually link everything to a gene, um, could take maybe I would die before it happens. Um, quite prevalent. Uh, these are called observational studies. So like psychology studies, there are many psychology studies which are done mostly for observing patients who are not taking drugs. Um, there are behavioral drugs. Sometimes you hear about these things like there was, uh, this, there was this, this result that got published uh, that was on the news a couple of days back that you are five times more likely to be in an accident if you were daydreaming versus if you were texting. And uh, that was a clinical trial, somebody did a trial. So there are trials like that. Uh, they're quite common, but they're not 50,000 of them, uh, but they are quite common. Yes, ma'am. When you began, you said that um, uh, more Yes. So their bodies have been altered with side effects and the other things they drew. So how valid is that result? Um, you know, how do you use that information when uh, your first premise has been violated? The the rule is that they should not be concurrently on multiple investigational drugs. So everybody who comes to you has taken some drugs in their past life. I have not met a person in my life who never took a drug. So everybody has a history, has a medical history, and the medical history for a cancer patient is their cancer treatment, whatever treatment they did. So the rule is that they should not be concurrently on other drugs. So if they are participating in another trial, then we won't take them on our trial. Is there a period of time since Yes. We call it a washout period. For every trial, we define anywhere from two to four weeks, sometimes longer, uh, since the last treatment. So for every trial, you would have something like that. Uh, it would depend uh, what what exactly are we worried about. If you're looking at radio... I'm just saying how valid is the result if the patient is not the patient who comes to you with the treatment. But I would have a control arm, I would have a placebo control where a patient, both the patients got same kind of background. One of them got the drug, the other one didn't. So I'll be able to distinguish between them. So that's how we usually do that. In the back. Let's let's take him first. How do you give informed consent if the if the uh, the thing you're testing is classified? Classified in what way? Well, there have been many many tests like plutonium. When plutonium wasn't known, it wasn't even known by name. They injected it into people in a hospital in Rochester. How, how can you possibly tell somebody well, what, well, okay. what the material is or, or give them informed consent if they don't even, they can't even mention the name? Well, that used to happen many, many years ago, and that's why we don't do that anymore. I think it's if, uh, 
Um, if they do happen, please tell me so I can tell the OHRP and get them audited. Because it's not, it, see, the thing is, okay, you know, that conspiracy theories do exist that US military does trials. There, there's all kinds of theories out there. But first of all, any such trial would be illegal. They'll be breaking the law. Now, does it mean nobody breaks the law? I, I would I would be totally if, totally lying if I say that doesn't happen. But if it's breaking the uh, well, I am not sure what classified study would be. But there are studies done by Department of Defense, for example. Actually, the U.S. military passed an passed a directive about ten years ago, which the U.S. military required every clinical trial that they are doing should get an FDA approval beforehand. Ten years ago, there was a rule that US military used to do studies, used to do clinical trials, that did not get any FDA blessing. So ten years ago, there was a directive passed by the, by the top generals in the military where no clinical trial can be funded unless it is approved by FDA. That was ten years ago. theories and I can't really go and debunk all of them but I can tell you if a drug was approved by FDA the rules the way they are right now it is impossible for a drug company to falsify results for example the amount of audits we do the amounts of inspections we do the amount of close scrutiny that each data each piece of data not each data as a group but each individual data element gets gets through these days it's impossible, almost impossible for a drug company to blatantly falsify the data. All the advertising, all the marketing the drug company does has to also be approved by FDA. FDA has a whole department where the drug company has to submit an advertising before they can release it to people. On top of it, there are orders done by Federal Trade Commission, orders done by FDA about marketing about off-label promotion. There are things like called off-label where drug companies will tell you something more than it is. And if you follow a fail, you'll find out whenever that does happen, drug companies do get caught and they do get fined hundreds of millions of dollars. There's this drug company, uh, this medical device company called Medtronix that was fined two billion dollars, two billion dollars for marketing their medical devices without getting proper permission from FDA. So there are rules out there. People do go out and do whistleblowers. There are company. This $2 billion was because of a sales agent that went and complained to the FDA uh, that this company was doing bad practices. So there are all kinds of episodes. And what has happened over time is that industry has become very careful about it. Because it's like really not worth it. If your product goes off market, you go to jail, and you end up paying boatloads of points. So these things have become less and less. I mean, yes, sir. So, well, there are there are drugs. There are I think the comparative effectiveness. There are superiority studies. There are different kinds of studies that companies do to show if their product is better, similar, or worse.
But to add to that, an insurance company or a medical practice cannot make decisions as to what drugs should or should not be given. It's the FDA that makes the decision. If they have data, people do file citizen petitions, people do petition the FDA saying that, you know, this drug doesn't work. And that's how Avastin uh, was taken off the market from breast cancer because people did do that saying, you know, this is ridiculous. It costs too much money. It doesn't really do anything. So, but they cannot make a decision. Uh, finally, it is FDA's decision if they would allow a drug to be in the market or not. Is that a question? Well, there is actually uh, there is actually a, 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 a directive signed by the last President Bush, uh, which talks about children uh, pediatric clinical trials to develop more treatments for children. The problem is for the industry um, doing a study in pediatric population has several political and uh, you know uh, PR issues. So the industry is usually scared of doing those studies because they could be easily they could easily be made into villains. So much of that study is done by government bodies. So if you go to NIH, I do a lot of studies for NIH. And NIH does a whole lot of studies in children uh, for that reason. Uh, it's many of those are done by nonprofit organizations. Many of them are done by, uh, by the government, uh, government bodies for that reason. So I mean, that's the reality of the day. I mean, as a drug company, I would not want to do a study in a pregnant woman not knowing if my drug would have an effect on the baby. Absolutely, if there is even a, even there is a, a one in a ten million chance of a baby getting hurt, I would not want to do the trial. Uh, I would let clinical experience tell, tell us about it. Mostly not, but there are some drugs that are approved for pregnant women. Also, there was a drug approved just on Friday uh, for morning sickness, uh, and that was actually done in pregnant women. <laughs> well, it does take that long. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Sometimes. a lot of money to get a drug approved. Uh, by some estimates, it costs anywhere from $400 million to upwards of $1.5 billion. Um, if you have a drug and you're making a copy of that drug, then that's a generic drug. Generic drugs don't cost as much, as you know. Uh, if, you are doing, if you're doing full development and you find a new drug, even for the same disease, but you do your own research, then the developers have to recoup their investment. So there is, there is a justification for that. Actually, it's, a, it's something that we have, all, uh, we have all accepted, and we have all actually encouraged it. We actually, the US government gives any new developer, new drug company, five years of exclusive market to recoup their investment. When somebody develops a new drug, for five years, nobody can challenge them. Nobody can make a generic of their drug. If you're developing a vaccine, then you get 12 years of exclusivity because the cost of developing a, a, a biologic drug, a protein uh, or, a, or a recombinant protein drug could cost a lot more. So there you give even more. So it is true that drugs, drugs do cost a lot of money to develop, but there are also market forces that do get governed what the cost of a drug would be. I mean, in many countries in the world, there is price control. The government decides how much the drug company can charge for a given drug. In the US, in a free market economy, that is not fair. Uh, people generally accept it's not fair to tell someone how much they should sell their product for. It's like telling you how much you should charge for your home. It's like, you know, you, the market decides how much your home is worth. If it's worth more, you get more. If it's worth less, you lose money. 
So drug companies do the same thing. They look at market forces, and that defines how much they can charge. More often than not, drugs do not make as much money as we think originally they would be. There was a list published uh, last week uh, from an industrial group which talked about drugs which were estimated to make a lot of money when they were approved, but actually they made less than 10% or 15% of the estimates, of the projection. So there are a lot more drugs like that. But yes, I mean, if you develop a copy, you get generic. That's cost of developing that generic is very little. So you have no market exclusivity, but you can compete with the comp competitor. But if you do develop a new drug, then you can sell your drug for whatever market will pay for it. Yes, ma'am. Um, contact lenses, uh, we don't do as many, but we do drugs on, trials on many devices, many kinds of medical devices. Um, yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, the first question about the drug marketing being expensive, uh, it is like any other, any other new product. When you make a new product, you have to spend money on marketing it, you have to spend money on advertising. If you need a Super Bowl ad, that could cost you like $5 million for like 20 seconds. Uh, so it depends on what your marketing campaign are. So drugs do get launched just like any other product, they have marketing campaigns, but as I said earlier, Many a times those marketing campaigns don't necessarily give you the revenue. I was just talking to one of my clients last week. They had a drug that was expected to make a hundred million dollars a year when it was approved. It made one million dollars. The drug company went out of business because they couldn't afford. I mean, they spent so much money, they raised so much money, and they spent like more than hundred million dollars to get the product approved, but the drug didn't sell. They couldn't sell it. They tried, they couldn't sell it. So they had to let go of all their people and go out of business. Human genome sciences, when they approved the lupus drug, it was projected to make $2.5 billion a year. It made less than $500 million. So less than 20% of the projection. So human genome sciences got bought by someone else because you know they had all the debt they had taken. So there, there is a lot of times that business, business, like any business, it's a business. So the usual business forces that would govern any business govern the pharmaceutical business as well. Um, so, you know, the companies do take that risk. And that is why, you know, if it takes 10 years plus, you took a drug 44 years ago and it got approved. Somebody took a risk 44. Yeah, so the point is when somebody, the, see the returns in, in a free market economy, your returns should be proportional to the risk you take. If they take a 10-year risk and spend hundreds of millions of dollars developing a drug, they should be able to recoup their investment any way they like. So they could have gone and bought bonds and invested and made 5% return a year, or they just had to make 500% and wait 10 years. It's a, it's a business decision. It's a financial decision that the company makes. And uh, thankful to the free economy that it doesn't take it away from us. And I think if it goes away, we would actually lose a lot of entrepreneurs who actually go out and take the risk. It's a very risky business. We see so many failures, so many companies go out of business, so many uh, mortgages go bankrupt because people can't afford to do the trial and they have to abandon it. So we do see a lot of failures in this industry as well. Uh, every year on average, FDA approves about 30, 20, and between 20 and 30 new drugs. Uh, there are at any time more than 200 of them in development. So very few drugs do are able to actually file for marketing approval and get approved. So there is a lot of risk in this field. And for that reason, uh, they have 
market to help them recoup when they do become successful. Let's take him. See, the biggest trial for a drug is when it comes in the market. The biggest trial. I could do a trial with 20,000 people and still not find a rare occurrence that happens once in 20,000 people. But once it goes to market and there are a million people taking it, you can do the math. I'll start seeing some of those patients. Anybody heard of Vioxx? It was an arthritis drug. It was approved under the standards that existed, but it had a cardiac side effect. It caused heart attack which was not known till the drug came in the market. So these things do happen. Um, you know, we all hope that we try to do as best as we can to capture all the side effects, but we can't. So there is there's something called a post-marketing study. Actually, FDA is requiring more and more companies to do a systematic post-marketing study. A post-marketing study is once the drug is approved, the drug manufacturer is required to go out and collect data from the patients who actually took the drug, who got prescribed, and submit an annually to FDA all kinds of side effects that they knew about. So this post market the, the question that I've got is, is the case where it's not a rare side effect, the side effect is actually known, but no data was provided to the FDA. Oh, oh, if they do that, then that would be actually committing a fraud. That would be a fraud. If somebody lies on your taxes, what does the IRS do? They audit you. They come and put you in jail if they can. Same thing applies to FDA. It's a federal government. If you hide information, if you lie, if you commit fraud, that's like any other illegal activity you do. But so, well, okay. <laughs> Well, well, okay. Um, well, the, yeah, the, it, it, in, in today's environment, it probably will not get approved because you may want to ignore it. The FDA, 20,000 people who work over there will not. I mean, we, we, I mean, I've been doing it for 10 years now, and I go over there, and before they come to a meeting, they will read all literature about it, and they will come and raise even rare things that we thought that, you know, are unrealistic, and ask us to test for it. So in today's time, it would be it would be almost impossible to not detect for the most things that you think are possible and not tested. It would not be feasible. It used to happen. See, all these rules that are set, these rules have existed, have, have been created because people used to do those things. And that's why they became more and more aggressive. Um, the most recent one is the compounding pharmacy. I mean, compounding pharmacies they used to think are safe. These are pharmacists, they know everything. And there were no rules for it. And then we had an accident. And they went out and checked for it, and they found almost everybody <coughs> was non compliant. So 38 out of 39. That's like not a number. That's like a, that's a something. That's something that stares at you. If you, if you have 38 out of 39 companies that are making unhygienic mixing compounds, having you know microbes growing on them, having people who are not properly protected. That's ridiculous. That's just not acceptable. So um, in today's time, is it perfect? It never can be. 
because it's a human clinical trial. There are always going to be human factors. There are always going to be things that we don't know about, about all drugs. But we're getting better and better at it. We are much better at it today than we were 10 years ago. And we'll be even better 20 years from now than we are today. 